<laughs> Here we go. Yes. Okay. So uh, good, good stuff today. Good stuff today. Uh, capitalizing on some of the things that you worked on in your homework, which is good. Um, okay. So. What we're going to do is we're going to talk today about rotating black holes, which ostensibly doesn't seem like anything super sexy over and above what we've already done for non-rotating black holes. I had a quick question about how next week's going to work with the harmonic waves or homework, or like since we don't So, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I meant to say this. Um, so the homework you just completed was your last homework. So you will not have a homework. You will not have a homework assignment due next Tuesday, partly because we're not having class next Tuesday because Physics Fest is happening next Tuesday. Uh, but I do plan on providing you with uh, your final exam um, Thursday of next week to give you a week to work on it because um, we agreed you turn it in the last day of class. Do we have okay. class on Thursday? Yes, you do have class on Thursday. Do we have normal office hours on dead week? Uh, dead week? Uh, yes. yes. Do we have class on Thursday? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Any other questions? Are, is there going to be stuff on the test pertaining to no, the class? No, the last, the last two or three lectures are certainly not going to be on the final exam. Um, and they're going to be very different from anything else we've done. We're going to be talking about cosmology and gravitational waves, which is very different from all the black hole stuff <laughs> and everything that came before. Other questions? How's your day? So, Yes, Brian. So which lecture will be the last one included in the exam? Is that next week? Or is that the next this Thursday? Yeah. It's 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 the following it's the last day of classes for the semester. It's that a Thursday. Be it's the day before the day. Included on the exam? No, no, I'm sorry, include on the exam. No, 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 no. Which which one is the last one included in the exam? This Thursday. This Thursday. Okay. Thank you. This Thursday. But it's a take home exam. I mean, yeah, you know, I, it's not I, like I, you I, gotta study sense. for it. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? And make sure you well, who's coming tomorrow to my talk? Oh. What time what? is it? It's at 7. Jonathan? It's right out there. What's Jonathan, happening? you're not coming? I have work. Wait, what's happening? You need to quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving a public lecture tomorrow, and it will be awesome. I'm going to give uh, my GR students some love in the lecture. You should be there. Are you like, what is you talking about? You said you gave me love. You gave us an extra homework problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I said we said thank you. Yeah, one homework problems. Anyway, I don't get this lecture. Y'all are going to shut up. Okay. <laughs> so, um. It's wow, man. We got to start at some point. It's what? The sounds. The sounds. Are you using the jumbotron? I'm so happy. <laughs> Say again? Have you taken care of the jumbotron for your slides? I have talked to Todd about it. He's supposed to, he put in a work order to get the cable out, and then we'll try it out tomorrow. Oh, no, I was just pointing to the back of the sound. Yes, thank you. I'm so happy. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm so nervous. I keep thinking I'm hearing it again, but I'm not. Okay, so. Um, that was me. It's <laughs> weird. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to rotate a black hole. It's like tough. All right, so uh, we get some really cool stuff, but um, let's talk for a minute about what we know. So uh, one way to think about rotating a black hole is to give a uh, Schwarzschild or a, a, a non-rotating black hole uh, angular momentum, okay, J. So we can think of it as actually rotating it or just in terms of dynamical quantities giving the black hole non-zero angular momentum. Those are interchangeable uh, statements about what we want to do, okay? So uh, before we spin it, we know that the geometry will be described by the Schwarzschild solution, yeah. which we can write down after studying this bad boy extensively. And the Schwarzschild solution, as you might guess, will provide a useful comparator for what we are doing in the less trivial case. Okay. Couple comments. Um, uh, GR itself. <coughs> so Einstein kind of, you know, finalized uh, the theory in about 1915, published it in 1916. Uh, the Schwarzschild solution 
uh, was obtained in 1916, about one year after the formal theory was finalized. Um, the theory for rotating black holes or the solution for rotating black holes is slightly more complicated. Okay, and to give you an idea of how much more complicated it is, it took a year to get this one. The rotating solution was done in 1963. Okay, so it is a considerably more complicated technical solution to this. There's a lot of symmetry that you get to employ in the Schwarzschild that is not there in the pair solution or the, or the rotating solution. So let's look at that. So two things to anticipate. are the following. First of all, <coughs> we are considering spinning or rotating at a constant rate. Okay, so if something is spinning at a constant rate, what we mean is it's, so don't think about like, it's not rotating and then I'm speeding it up. You know, you like go whack on a black hole, you know, nothing gonna happen. <laughs> this thing is just spinning. It's got an angular momentum, it's iso otherwise isolated. So it's spinning at a constant rate. That means if you look at it now, and if you look at it 15 minutes from now, it's going to look the same, right? It, so in terms of what we can expect about depending on parameters in the metric, well, how is that going to reflect in the solution? It's not going to depend on T. It's going to be T independent. Okay, however, and we've noted this before, it is spinning. And so if you made a movie of it spinning and then you played the movie in reverse, would it behave differently? Yes. yes. What would it do? It would spin in the opposite direction. How do we expect that to be reflected in the metric? Cross terms, Cross -terms between? P and Something. Yes. Okay. So it's spinning. It's T independent. That is, of course, what we call stationary, uh, but not static. And that means we should imply some cross terms in the metric. Okay? Yeah, Alex. Uh, is there any drag due to the gravitational waves in the real Bible? Uh, don't ask me that question right now. <laughs> that is way too far beyond what we're going to do. We, we need to get our teeth wet with spinning black holes first. Um, and actually, this, this topic is going to drag into the next lecture uh, by a lot. And that's actually where we're going to hit some ideas uh, that you're, you're talking about. Okay, so uh, another thing is um, if we uh, align the spin with coordinates, so remember there are people out there who do problems in electromagnetism with cylindrical geometry but then choose the axis of their cylindrical coordinates, you know, not to line up with that, and we call those people? Engineers. Well, I was going to say stupid, but put the camera on Madison who said engineers. If we, align, if we align the coordinates such that the axis of symmetry is kind of lined up with the axis around which this thing is rotating, then what we can expect is if we use some kind of thing like spherical polar coordinates, although there'll be a generalization of that, then in the azimuthal direction, so this thing is spinning around this axis, in the azimuthal direction, we should expect symmetry. Things should not depend on the azimuthal angle phi, okay? However, if we change the angle theta, the polar angle, we expect the geometry to depend on that. This is really no different than when you spin the Earth and it actually squashes a little bit on the poles or on the axis of the rotation, creating an oblate spheroid. It's symmetric in the azimuthal angle, but its geometry actually depends on theta a little bit. Okay? All right, so those are things that we could expect. Without any further ado, this is the solution, and we are going to study it in detail. So in 1963, Kerr found the following solution. <coughs> It's a row, that's a row, that's a G, that's an M, that's an R, that's a square, that's a Q. You do have to. That is an A. That's an R. 
So, see, usually I don't read out what I'm writing, but I'm now beginning to think maybe that's a good idea. That's a row. <laughs> I can't do it. That's a row. That's a delta. Dr squared. Oh shit! Is my yeah my delta is not squared. Why is there another two in front of the dp dt? Tell you in a sec. Tell you in a sec. Okay, there it is. Okay, that is a delta. The reason there's a two there, as Madison asked, this is the cross term. So if you wrote this as a matrix, you would have a term here and a term here. And those two matrix elements would not have the two. They would just be, def they would have this coefficient. And then when you use the matrix with the coordinate differential vector to create the line element, those two things contribute in the same way, and that gives you the factor of two. Okay, so that two is just reminding you that in a matrix form, this would appear in two different entries. Okay, so the way that um, Kerr got to this was he guessed. I'm kidding, he didn't guess. Um, and we should be careful because whenever we write down a geometry, we should always specify what coordinates we're working with. And for Kerr, he is working in what are called boyer lindquist coordinates. Why can't people name coordinates like that? Not after themselves. Man, I wrote a paper with some friends and we so wanted, we, we had this aspiration to name a space time. We wanted to call it a monodrofold. <laughs> we named it Stick. We named it Stick. We wrote a song about it, did a performance. Oh, that this story. Yeah, that yeah that's that story. Is it on YouTube? Did a performance with interpretive dance, no. Was that? Um, the name didn't stick. So now they're called uh, non geometric. Brian yes, that was with Ninja <gasps> Brian. What? No, I'm sorry, that was not with Ninja Brian. I wrote the paper with Ninja Brian, but Ninja Brian was not at the performance. He was off like being a real performer. Anyway, okay. So a couple of things to note. Uh, there's some quantities in here that I have to define for you. A, A is the quantity that is going to capture for us, uh, and we'll use the symbol for angular momentum L. Um, it is the quantity which is capturing for us the angular momentum being non-zero. Uh, delta, that's this guy right here. That, this is actually a function of R. And uh, some other things, including A. And then rho squared, which is the thing that appears here, and here, and here, and here, and there. Rho squared is everywhere, it's up in everybody's business. Rho squared actually depends on both r and theta and takes the value r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta, okay? Everybody write that metric down because I'm gonna have to erase it. It can't stay around, it's just too big. It's a board hog and we hate it. Okay, a couple of important things to note before we launch into interpretation or, or real interpretation. Let's actually get the easy parts out of the way. First of all, if A goes to zero, what should this become, Tom? If I set A to zero in this bad boy, what should this become? Based on the idea of how we're creating it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stare at this and try and set A to zero. That'll give you a headache. Yes, and, uh, just the short yeah, yeah, so A is where we're capturing the fact that we're giving it non-zero angular momentum. So setting A to zero, we can achieve by setting the angular momentum to zero, but that redu this should reduce to a Schwarzschild black hole. And if you actually go through the form of this, you'll find that it does reduce to Schwarzschild. Okay? And in fact, the Boyer-Lindquist coordinates will reduce to Schwarzschild coordinates. So you literally get exactly the same solution that we had up here. Okay. Remember, this is, and this is something we'll repeat again today, but I'll say it again just to remind you, this is the Schwarzschild coordinate, this Schwarzschild geometry in which set of coordinates? Schwarzschild coordinates. Remember, we found a lot of mileage out of taking one geometry and casting it in many different coordinates, and we'll do the same today. Okay. 
So here we find the care geometry and Boyer-Lindquist coordinates in the limit A goes to zero reduces to Schwarzschild and Schwarzschild coordinates. Furthermore, if we take R goes to infinity with M and A fixed, so they can't like go to infinity or anything weird like that, what do we expect the geometry to become? Yeah, this actually ends up becoming Minkowski space. Asymptotically far away, it's just flat space, okay? And you can do that uh, yourself. I mean, the most notable thing here is that uh, rho squared effectively becomes r squared, okay? Because a is held at some finite fixed value. Cosine squared is only in a range between one and minus one. So you can replace rho squared with r squared everywhere and this term is going to be dominated by r squared and so it's pretty easy to see that this thing simplifies to good old flat space in spherical polar coordinates. Okay. And then last but not least, there's sort of a weird limit where you can take the mass going to zero with a fixed. This is strange. This is like taking the thing and trying to give it zero mass but infinite angular momentum. Mm -hmm. So, and what you actually discover is that um, this thing actually becomes flat space, but in oblate spheroidal coordinates. And I write down what the metric looks like in the notes. But wouldn't uh, the angular momentum go to zero? Say again? Uh, wouldn't the angular momentum go to zero? Oh, sorry, sorry, the angular momentum. I'm keeping, yeah, 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 sorry. Sorry, the angular momentum is going to zero. Right, yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so these are just various limits. These two at least should be intuitive. This one, eh, it's not so intuitive, but um, they all work out. Now what we really want to do, though, is try and give this thing an interpretation, and that is where it's going to hit the fan. Okay. So when we um, analyzed the Schwarzschild geometry, one of the first things we noted was that both of these terms presented a bit of a problem for various values of r. For r equals 2gm, we noticed that this term was 0 and this term was diverging. diverging. Okay. And we eventually identified r equals 2gm as a true singularity or a coordinate singularity? As a coordinate singularity, it's the location of the horizon of the Schwarzschild black hole. Um, and so we transform to a new set of coordinates to resolve that coordinate singularity. R equals zero, on the other hand, makes both of these terms go a little cray-cray. And uh, R equals zero, in fact, does turn out to be a true singularity. And so when we look at the care geometry, we notice a lot of terms in the denominators that could do interesting things, okay? And so we're going to do the same exploration of the various singularities that are popping out of the care metric. Okay. So without any further ado, I'm going to come up here. Let us... Yeah, you wrote it down. You won't need it. Okay, so... Um... <clears throat> So first of all, rho equals zero, okay? Just like r equals zero in the Schwarzschild case, rho equals zero is a true curvature singularity. Okay? How did we figure out that r equals zero was a curvature singularity in the Schwarzschild case? What did we do? We looked at curvature invariance built from the Riemann curvature tensor. Because if you look at a curvature invariant, that quantity doesn't change when you change coordinates. All right? And we found that there was a particular curvature invariant which was going to infinity as r goes to zero. And therefore, in the Schwarzschild geometry, r equals zero is a true singularity. We looked at, if you look at all the curvature invariants and you take r equals 2gm, none of them blow up. That's how we, one of the ways we identified r equals 2gm as a coordinate singularity. Okay, so by analogy in the curve geometry, rho is a curvature singularity, but it turns out to be a very interesting one, okay? So we are going to study 
the row equals zero singularity. So first of all, row squared is what really appears, and it appears further out here, but I erased it. Row squared, r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta equals zero. That's really what we mean when we're talking about the curvature singularity. But in order to get that thing to vanish, I need what value of r? A cosine theta. So these are both positive numbers. So what does r have to be? R has to be zero, and what does theta have to be? Pi over two. Pi over two. Or negative pi over two, three pi over two, it doesn't matter. So notice there's a condition on both r and theta. It's a little weird, okay? Wasn't the case in the Schwarzschild geometry. In the Schwarzschild geometry, it didn't matter what any of the other coordinates were. When r, equal, was, r was equal to zero, curvature singularity, okay? Here, not so trivial. All right, so um, before we look at rho equals to zero, okay, consider r equals to zero, all right? r equals zero should be something relatively straightforward, right? We got this coordinate system. It's kind of like spherical polar coordinates with a funky name. And you're talking about r equals zero, right? What's that look like? What does it look like? A point. Okay, exactly wrong. <laughs> this is going to rock your world, so get ready. So in order to explore what r equals zero looks like, what the geometry of r equals zero is, we need to appeal to the metric. The metric is what tells us about the geometry. So if we take the metric, and we evaluate it at r equals zero, okay? Now notice when we take r equals to zero, delta does not vanish because delta keeps this a squared term. Similarly, rho squared doesn't vanish when r is equal to zero because we've got this a squared cosine squared theta term, okay? So there's a lot of love in here that doesn't trivially go to zero like you might think. And so the form of the metric that we have left when we set r equals to zero is of the following. I'm gonna write this in what might seem like a weird way at first, and then I'll make sense of it in just a second. Okay. And there's a, there, there's a piece there that you can look at in your notes, and it's what ended up giving rise to that term. Okay. So, hmm, ah, that's really interesting. Um, you know, when I read my notes, I was like, why did I just square this out? And then it kind of looks like that. And there's actually a really good reason why I didn't do it, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm going to call this whole term right here and related to it, that term right there, I'm going to call this thing right here R twiddle, and then this thing actually becomes dr twiddle. Okay? Just look at it, if r twiddle is a sine theta, and you take the differential of that, a is a constant, so you're really just two in the derivative with respect to theta, that gives you cosine theta d theta. Mike? Why are we keeping the cosine theta if we said that theta is equal to pi over two so that much? Sorry, say it again? Are we constraining theta? No, no we're, right now we're just doing r equals zero, and theta can be anything, and then in a minute we'll take the extra condition that theta is equal to pi over two. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm, look, I'm not looking necessarily at the singularity yet. Okay? I'm just trying to convey to you that something as simple as r equals zero is already complicated. Okay? Now, uh, yeah, so the values of theta in these Boyer Lindquist coordinates, this is a polar angle, so it ranges from zero to pi, just like the normal polar angle in spherical polar coordinates does. And so this actually forces our value of r twiddle to exist on the interval from zero to a, okay? But now let's actually think about what this geometry looks like. So at r equals zero, the geometry is minus dt squared plus dr twiddle squared plus r twiddle squared d phi squared, where r goes from zero to a and theta goes from zero to 
or don't worry about theta. Phi, sorry, I should have said this. So phi is the azimuthal angle. So this, I'm, ref, I'm referencing spherical polar coordinates. Is everybody comfortable with those? Theta goes from zero to pi or minus pi over two, pi over two, and phi goes zero to two pi, okay? What geometry is that describing? M3. Say it again? M3. Almost. I mean, it's R doesn't go to infinity. It's M3 plus in this circle. S2 plus 1. Yeah. No. What? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, so this is actually describing the interior of a cylinder. Of radius what? A. A. Okay. The T, the axis of the cylinder is T. Okay, and it's a time-like direction, so it's got that minus in there. But uh, this part is just describing the interior of a disc of radius A. And then if we extend it a long time, it creates a solid cylinder. Yeah, right. Is it not, is it only the interior? Because our twiddle includes A, so why would we just be the entire cylinder? I'm sorry, it's the boundary and the interior. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, it's the boundary and the interior. So it is, it is the solid cylinder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was that what you were expecting for R equals zero? It's not what Caleb was expecting. Well, you didn't ask for that. I know. <laughs> you asked in spherical. I know. 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 Hey, if we take if we take Schwarzschild at R equals zero, what does it look like? Trash. Uh, uh, <laughs> that looks horrible, doesn't it? It's horrible. But notice, yes, this term is, is going cuckoo on us, but if we fix R, this whole term is zero, this term is zero, so this is really kind of, yes, it's divergent, but it kind of goes like minus dt squared, and so the way we can interpret that is it's just a point that extends upwards in the time-like direction. The Schwarzschild R equals zero is truly a point-like singularity. It's just propagating in time. Not so for the care. R equals zero is weird. But let's go beyond r equals zero and say, okay, the true singularity is when r equals zero and when theta equals pi over two. Where in this geometry is theta equals pi over two? Say it again. Ryan? Just an angle, like it's a it's a plane along the cylinder, like. Galen? Cross-section. It's the surface. What? Look at how we defined our twiddle. It's A sine theta. When theta is pi over 2, what is this? A. It's A. So theta being pi over 2 is our twiddle being A. So what we find is that Rho squared equals zero is the surface of this cylinder. We old. Will we? Will we? We old. Was it rho squared equals zero? I mean, I get that when you're squaring zero, it doesn't matter, but you said when rho equals zero, it's a true curvature singularity? Well, rho is positive. <laughs> when woe is positive, woe squared equals zero. Only when woe is zero. Yeah, no, it's rho squared or rho. Yeah, we'll just say the rho squared. Good night. Okay, okay, hold on. Okay, folks, this is weird, but. We're all weird, so. But. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. Should have been expecting it. Yeah. You were, weren't you? Goddamn right you were. <laughs> what has just happened? What has just happened? Let me explain to you what just happened. In the Schwarzschild geometry, the singularity at r equals zero at an instant of time is just a point. Okay? In the spinning cow geometry, 
I'm not going to do voices anymore. Yeah, you're all over the place. I know, I can't be consistent. I know, I know. Anyway, in the care geometry, the singularity, the curvature singularity has been blown up into a circle. This propagates in time, this propagates in time, and creates the surface of a cylinder. Okay? It blows up into a circle of radius A. Why might you have expected that? Well, let me tell you why. All right? A Schwarzschild black hole has how many parameters which actually describe the particular geometry you're dealing with? How many parameters are hiding in here? One. One. Which, what is it? Mass. It's the mass. Okay? The mass in here, G is just a fundamental constant. The mass determines everything about this black hole. Okay? However, what we're doing now is we're taking that, that black hole and we're spinning it. We're giving it one more piece of information that is different than the mass. We're giving it an angular momentum. Okay? Somehow the black hole has to encode that there's an extra piece of information that can't be encoded in the mass because that's just telling us about the Schwarzschild geometry and how much stuff actually went into forming this. The information about the spinning of the black hole is reflected in the fact that the singularity has been extended into this circle whose radius is determined by the amount of angular momentum that we've given the black hole in conjunction with the mass. Yes, Mike. So is this like a physical disk that is like in the five plane? Like like, if, if you had a, I don't know, like, is it, is it an actual disk that's just... Well, it's a circle. Right. Or it's not a disk. It's not a solid disk. It's not the interior of the circle. It's just the outer edge of the circle. R equals zero includes the inside, but the singularity is at rho squared equals zero, which is just the outside, just the circle itself. But, like, in spatial coordinates, would it also be a circle? But, like, is this in spatial coordinates because it's just... With the time, I don't know what what's our what's our thought about the time axis thing. What does this look like? It's just a circle. Just a circle. <laughs> We're gonna explore actually how we interact with this circle and what you can do with the circle. I agree with you, like, yes, it's a circle, but it's sitting in a four-dimensional space-time. What does that really mean? What does it mean to have a circle extended in time? And we're going we're gonna explore that in in studying this geometry further. So I think you'll feel a bit better about what this thing means in a few minutes. Ryan. So can you exist on the inside of that circle without actually being a singularity? Yes. And we're so gonna talk about we're this? gonna talk about what doing that will entail. Okay. Okay. So all of these questions are great and we will we will we will explore them. Okay. Alright. So before I go any further I'm going to regret this. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay, so um, the other, my board technique today is just going to suck because I don't know what to erase and what to keep. But anyway, um, just erase. Oh, no, I'm going gonna, gonna to do this. I'm going to do this. No, this is good. This is good. This is good because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase all this and then I'm going to keep what I'm about to write up here because this will be useful to reference later. Okay? So the other singularity is at delta equals zero, okay? Now, delta equals zero, just if you were guessing, do you think that would be a true curvature singularity or a coordinate singularity? A coordinate singularity. Now, hey, don't forget, just because it's, it's not a curvature singularity and it's a coordinate singularity does not mean that it's not cool. In fact, the horizon of a black hole is its coolest feature. That's where really wonky stuff happens. So delta equals zero, it turns out, is a coordinate singularity. And from our last topic, we know that really exploring uh, coordinate singularities, resolving them so that you can actually move through them, requires adopting new coordinate systems, etc. And then you get some really wonky effects. Okay. So um, from the definition of delta R here, we can say that if I set this thing equal to zero, it is a quadratic in R. So to solve for the radius at which delta equals zero, 
we find two solutions, and they are of the following form. And this is nothing more than applying the quadratic equation to this thing. There's nothing sophisticated there, no highbrow calculus of variations, anything like that. But, interestingly, we notice that there are how many horizons? Or how many coordinate singularities, I should say? There are two. There are two coordinate singularities. The R plus, the R minus value. They're two different values. Okay? So we are going to explore the geometry for various values of these. Okay? And it turns out that a really interesting way to explore the geometry is to take the quantity A and actually just treat it like a dial. So we, we imagine we've got an A dial. Okay, and we're just going to turn it. And it's going to start at zero. So when A is zero, what should this thing be reproducing for us? Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. Okay, and then what we can do is we can increase A. Clearly, interesting things happen when A gets to certain values. And so we're going to explore all of the interesting cases. Okay? So um, one thing to note is the following. And this is going to be looking at regions outside of where delta is zero. So when delta is zero, it doesn't have a sign. But if you're on either side of the radial value that makes delta equal zero, then delta will have either a positive or a negative sign. And the sign of delta Okay, because delta appears in front of the dr squared term. Okay. And notice delta can be a positive or a negative number. The sine of delta determines the behavior of the radial coordinate. And let me give you an idea of what that means. Okay. If we come back to the Schwarzschild geometry, if you're outside of the horizon, what is the sign of the term in front of dr squared? Positive. It's positive. If you're inside of the horizon, what is the sign of the term in front of dr squared? If you're outside of the horizon, what is the sign of the term in front of dt squared? Negative. Negative. And if you're inside of the horizon, what is the sign of the term in front of dt squared? Positive. Okay, now let me say something which might not have been obvious from our study, but it turns out to be very useful in making cursory analyses. In your metric, if the coefficient of a coordinate differential squared, if the coefficient is negative, that coordinate is behaving like time. So inside of the Schwarzschild horizon, radius kind of behaves like time, and time behaves more like a spatial coordinate. The reason that's important is because in physics, you can only move in one direction in time. In spatial coordinates, you can move in any direction you want to larger and smaller values. But time evolution only goes forward into the future. So the way you can think about that is that when you're inside of the horizon of the Schwarzschild geometry, the fact that the radial coordinate is behaving like time is reflected in the fact that once you're inside the horizon, you can only move in one direction in the radial direction. It's towards r equals zero. That is a reflection of that fact, which we talked about in detail last time. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of the sine of delta because it's going to tell me whether the radial direction is behaving time-like meaning you can only move in one radial direction, or space-like, which means you can move to bigger or smaller values of r. Yes? What does that mean for your experience of time on the inside? Don't worry about your experience of time. Your experience of time is just weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so let, me, let me actually go through uh, some important cases. So first of all, when a is equal to zero, what is r minus? Hey. Zero? It's zero. And as a follow-up, what is our plus? Also, no, two Gs. Two GM. Two GM. 
Okay. So in the in the a equals zero case, what we can do is we can say that there is an r plus and r minus. If you're outside of r plus, then delta is positive, which means you can move in either direction. But if you go inside of r plus, delta is negative, which means you can only move in one direction, and it turns out to be inwards. But what am I describing? I'm just describing the Schwarzschild black hole. Okay. So this is just the Schwarzschild. It's a, it's the Schwarzschild case. It's just the limit of the Kerr case. Okay. Now we start turning the dial. All right. As I turn the dial, what I'm going to do is have a be non-zero but less than g squared m squared. Okay. So I want this root to not be imaginary. This has a name. It's called a sub-extremal geometry. Okay. And we find, as perhaps expected, that the positive root gives us a radial value larger than the negative root. Okay. They're both positive, but one is bigger than the other. And then if we actually draw what happens, it looks like the following. So first of all, let's remember, and I'm going to draw a cross section, okay, because drawing this in 3D is going to be hard. So imagine we've got this black hole and we're just going to draw a cross section. So the singularity that was a point is now a ring. When I take a cross section, it kind of looks like that. Actually, I should draw it like this, two points. Okay, and then we have an R minus. and an R plus, and you might notice that I'm not drawing these as circles, which would be the cross sections of spheres, because a fixed R value in this geometry does not create a circular geometry. It actually creates this oblate spheroid. And you can study that by taking this metric, setting it to a fixed R, and then exploring what the geometry looks like. This is what we expect, though, because we spun the black hole, and the result is this deformation squashing along the axis about which it's spinning, okay? So we have the R minus solution there, the R plus solution there, and then we get some interesting results. Outside of R plus, delta is positive, so we have trajectories which can go in or which can go out. Inside of R plus but outside of R minus, delta becomes negative, and so it seems as though we have trajectories which are aimed only radially inwards, and that is something we'll discuss in more detail in a few minutes. But when you get here, delta actually becomes positive again. So inside of the R minus radius, you can move to smaller or larger values of the radial coordinate. Okay. Very different than what we found in the Schwarzschild case. But if you think about it, if I took A and I now had this thing spinning and then I slowed A down, what would happen? These two dots would merge together to give me the singularity and R minus would shrink to zero on top of the dot, reducing to the Schwarzschild horizon structure. Okay? Yes? So what are the two dots? Those are, so that remember the singularity so this is row squared equals zero. The singularity is a ring, but I'm slicing it in half, so it's the two dots. Does that make sense? This whole picture gets evolved around the phi axis to create the full spatial geometry. Are we good? Okay, one more case. When a squared is equal to g squared m squared, we have what is called an extremal Kerr black hole. In the extremal case, we actually find that r plus is equal to r minus because the root vanishes. 
okay? So there is no distinction between R plus and R minus. If we actually draw what's going on in this geometry, we have one horizon radius. If we're outside of the horizon, delta is positive, so you have trajectories which move towards or away from increasing r. If you move inside of that horizon, you also have delta greater than zero. And so once again, you have trajectories which move to larger or smaller values of r. Again, visually, you can kind of see what's happening as you take the limit. So as I speed this up more and more and more, what happens is the R minus radius grows until it meets the R plus radius. But what that does is it gets rid of this neighborhood where delta is less than zero. And you're just left with this neighborhood and this neighborhood. OK? Alex? Does that mean that an event horizon kind of can vanish if you spin it fast enough? I, 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 I'm, I'm going to talk about it. I'm, gonna, I work, I'm not done exploring this. Like, I'm just getting started. We've got a long way to go. But I will say this. You studied this geometry in your homework. That was the geometry you were studying in your homework, where the terms in the metric were squared. OK? Last but not least, and I'm not, I'm not even by a long shot done with interpreting this, OK? Trust me. If a squared is greater than g squared m squared, then we have to go back to the drawing board. And we have what is called an over-extreme black hole. And what we discover is that in this case, there is no horizon at all. And that geometry would correspond to a naked singularity. That is, you would still have a curvature singularity at rho squared equals zero, but there would be no sense of a horizon cloaking it. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, that's not much of a horizon, but trust me, it is, and we'll explore it, okay? But in the case of an over-extreme black hole, you end up with no horizon whatsoever, which means you have a naked singularity. And here's the incredible thing, which we're going to study in detail. You can't turn the dial that high. We're going to try next time, and we'll find out that you can't. Okay. And this supports something called... Okay, the cosmic censorship conjecture, which we're going to talk about. But go ahead. <laughs> is, it, is it just because you can't get enough angular momentum? I, I will... Yeah, I, I'm going to... I'll, I'll explain it. You're, what, you'll, it's, a, it's a technical argument. It does have to do with trying to get the thing more and more angular momentum. Okay, so... So what I want to do now, because I have hardly done it, is give all of these an interpretation. Okay? Now when we did this for the Schwarzschild geometry, the first thing that we found was going to Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates helped us explain what was happening with where you could and couldn't go, because we, not, we noticed in Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates the light cones tipped over, they didn't close up, so we could carry things through the horizon. But then to really get a gist of what was going on, we actually went to what are called Kruskal coordinates. And then that let us actually geodesically complete the space and get some really interesting results. What we're going to do today is we're actually going to just jump straight to a final set of coordinates, which go even further than Kruskal. Okay? And you might say, what the hell more could you do than what you did with Kruskal. And it turns out that there's one thing that Kruskal coordinates was kind of lacking. So what Kruskal coordinates were lacking was the fact that infinity was off over here, infinitely far away. And infinity was off over here, infinitely far away. Okay? We did have these r equals zero, so there's nothing here and there's nothing here. But infinity, you know, you can't draw it. You can't draw the whole space time. What we're going to do now is we're going to 
create a method of drawing the entirety of space-time, including infinity, in one finite picture. Very impressive. Okay. These kinds of diagrams were originated by Penrose, Roger Penrose, if you haven't heard of him. Um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time developing them. And yeah, I am going to spend some time with <laughs> detail. Okay, so to get our um, hands dirty with conformal diagrams, we're going to start with a very simple case, and that's just flat Minkowski space. Um, and that actually plays an important role in black hole geometries because we know that far away from a black hole, things should always look like Minkowski space. So let me show you how this works. So ds squared in Minkowski space in spherical polar coordinates is, of course, given by this, where the ranges that are kind of giving us a headache are that in time goes from minus infinity to infinity, and the radial coordinate goes from 0 to infinity. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take these coordinate ranges, which we could not possibly ever draw, right? Hard to draw a line that's infinitely long or even semi-infinitely long. And we're going to reach out and touch someone and grab infinity and pull it in close. Now I'm looking at you, Danielle, because as of our conversation last night, you might remember how you could take something which is ostensibly infinite and somehow bring it into a finite value. What kinds of functions do that for us? Arctangent. Tangents. Arctangent functions. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce new time and radial coordinates by using arctangents. And in terms of those coordinate redefinitions, what you can find is that r is constrained to be greater than 0, but less than pi. That is, you can take all the values allowed for little t and little r and explore what values of big R you get from it, and you just find that r ranges from 0 to pi. And then, weirdly, and we'll deal with it, the value of t is constrained by the value of capital R. It's finite, okay? But depending on what the value of R is, it can be anywhere from pi to zero. Okay, and I did that right, because if I plug in R equals zero, T is pi, T can be up to pi. If I plug in R as pi, then T can only be zero, okay? So let me very quickly run through what happens in Minkowski space. If we write the metric in these new coordinates, <coughs> what we find is that the metric takes this form. Okay. Which we can think of as Something like this. Okay, a couple of important things to note. First of all, notice R in this metric is actually behaving like an angle. Okay? It's behaving more like an angular coordinate. Which, of course, is reflected in, the, in its range as well. Um, now, this factor right here is an overall function which multiplies the, the rest of the metric. And it's positive. This is what is called a conformal factor. And the rest of the metric that that conformal factor multiplies is what is called the conformally related geometry. Okay? So to give you an idea, the geometry described by ds squared is infinite in size. All right? 
but the conformally related geometry is going to be finite. And in order to get something infinite from something finite, you need this factor, which blows it back up. Okay? So you might say, this geometry and this geometry are different. Why not? But there's actually one crucial property that they share that makes it very useful to study this conformally related geometry. What can you tell me that ds squared has in common with ds twiddle squared? What do they have in common? When would this conformal factor be irrelevant? When what is equal to what? When that is equal to? Zero. When that is equal to zero, what am I describing? I'm describing light cones in this geometry. But light cones in this geometry are light cones of this geometry. But light cones are what we really care about. They tell us where you can and can't go. So studying the light cones in the conformally related geometry gives us the same information that we would get by studying the light cones in the original geometry, which we can't draw because it's infinite. Okay. So that is the power of these things. And by the way, I'm going to talk about conformal geometries in my public lecture tomorrow. I don't really know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to. Okay. All right. Have a whole extra week to prepare for. Yeah, I know. I had a whole extra week. Okay. So what we're going to do is is draw a picture of what this thing looks like, um, and. Here we go. I hate this. All right. It's because you guys asked me so many questions at the beginning of class, and I'm running out of time. Go ahead and ask me the question. I'm going to try and run the board. Ask me the question. I can answer and talk. What's the omega term? What is this? Yeah. What do you mean, what is it? Well, what is omega? Like, well, well th this, this whole thing is a function of T and R squared, and it happens to, in oh, this okay. instance, so if I have a geometry that is related to another geometry by a positive position-dependent scaling factor, this is called a conformally related geometry. This is the particular case I'm dealing with now. So you can literally take this, set it equal to that, and figure out what omega is. So this is a generic thing. It's how you relate one geometry to a conformally related geometry. Yeah. And you want to make sure this function is positive, because if it were negative, you'd be messing up time and space kinds of things. This is literally just a position-dependent rescaling. Okay? Okay, so, um, yeah, here we go. So if I do purely radial motion, I don't worry about moving in angular directions, then I can plot what this thing actually looks like. Um, so I've got this cylinder. And T capital T is the axis of the cylinder. I'm drawing it like this because R is acting like an angular coordinate, so when I think about an angular coordinate, it's natural to think about that angle as moving around a circle, okay? So R uh, equals zero might be this line right here. Okay? When R is equal to zero, what values can T take? from negative pi to pi. So this turns out to be the t equals negative pi, and this is the t equals pi value. That's these two points. And then t can be anything between negative pi and pi. Okay? But now, as I increase r, what happens to the range of the values of t? It gets smaller and smaller. So what happens is actually when you reach the diametrically opposite side of the circle, when r is equal to pi, t can only take one value, and that's zero. So you have this interesting scenario where this guy wraps like that. Okay? And the geometry is everything in this circle as it wraps, and nothing outside of it. So who likes to draw cylinders, 3D, pain in the ass, let's flatten it out. I know you do like Mike, but tough. So we're going to flatten it out. It's really well done. It's actually pretty, pretty bad. I, as I was drawing it, I was disappointed in myself. But anyway, okay, so if I flatten this thing out, then this geometry takes the following form.
Okay. And I'm going to do some labeling here. So that's scree. What? Scree? 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 All right, so let me point out a few things. First of all, the dashed lines here are constant r values, where I'm now referring to little r, the original Schwarzschild radius, or the, the sorry, the Boyle lens. No, sorry, we're in flat space right now. This is the polar coordinate radius. Um, the dashed lines this way are constant t lines. Okay, this particular dashed line through the middle is t equals zero. So t equals minus infinity is the line that goes all the way down here. So you could draw a dashed line like that. It would be t equals minus infinity, t equals plus infinity is up here. This is the r equals zero line, and then these are lines of constant r. r equals infinity would be the one that actually goes all the way out to this point, okay? Here is the really nice thing about this diagram. If you draw the light cones in this diagram, and I erase, oh yeah, so the, the form of the metric, if I ignore radial motion, looks like that. What do the light cones look like? They're 45 degrees. So anywhere you are on this picture, you can draw a light cone opening at 45 degrees to the past and the future. Are those constant timelines curved or not? They're curved. Okay. Yeah. Because asymptotically they approach the screen plus and screen minus. Okay. So, all right. So, give me. Let me give you some ideas of what these quantities are. Because this is going to be the language that we're going to use to identify uh, other geometries. So, I plus and I minus. This is time like future infinity. <laughs> this is time like past infinity. Okay. And what we know is that all m greater than zero geodesics begin at i minus and end at i plus. That is, if you ask a massive object moving through the space-time, so it has to live inside of the light cone. If you continue the geodesic to infinity and the, you know, just let it go on forever, any geodesic you pick, if you trace it backwards in time, will end up at that point. This is if you're dealing with a massive object like you. If you follow it to the infinite future, it will end up at that point. But think about it. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking infinity, like if, you, if I followed, if I set something in motion and let it go for infinity, it would end up infinitely far away. Well, we're grabbing infinity and we're bringing it in. But what's weird is there are different shades of infinity, 50 shades of infinity, okay? This is the infinity that would be reached by a massive object. That is different than the infinity that is reached by a massless object. If you have light-like objects, massless objects, infinitely far in the past, they must have started somewhere on this line of scree minus, and infinitely far in the future, they must end somewhere on this line scree plus. Okay. And lastly, we have space-like infinity. 
That is, if you take a snapshot in time and you say, okay, I'm gonna go infinitely far away in a spatial direction, that's this point. Think about t equals zero, that's infinity. This is r equals zero, that would be r equals infinity, infinitely far away, okay? All right, I, uh, I am not gonna do it to you. I've got two more pages of notes, but um, it's, uh, it's gonna have to wait until next time. Um, I strongly encourage you to come to my talk tomorrow. If you want, it'll be awesome. We'll have fun. Caleb. Uh, do you not encounter the same problem as the geodesic that we have? At the other side, it's the geodesic hit a wall. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying, do I need to add something over here? Well, no, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to answer Caleb's question because some of you might be like, hey, Flarnoy, do you have to extend this? So first of all, this is flat space. It's already geodesically complete. There's no need to extend it. But his question was, what if you had a geodesic that was headed to the left? Would it not just cross this line? Okay? And that's what's weird about these conformal diagrams. Anything to the right is a, a non-zero positive value of R. But if you're, if you're going to smaller and smaller values of R, and then you hit R equals zero, what happens when you go through R equals zero? You're now going to larger and larger values of R. So a geodesic would actually go this way and then turn around and go back that way. Okay. Because it's just passing through the origin in spherical polar coordinates. Just, just comes up.